Welcome to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. I'm Sunny Agarwal, and today we're speaking with Louis Gurgen and Arya Klagis Munt, who are the co founders of Gyroscope, a new stablecoin project. Before we talk to Louis and Arya about Gyroscope, though, we'd like to tell you about our sponsors this week. The first, Proof of Stake is transforming crypto, and you can be a part of it. You can start participating in networks and contribute to network security and earn rewards by staking with Chorus One. Chorus One is your staking provider securing billions of assets for over 10,000 customers on 25 networks, including Solana, Cosmos, and Ethereum. Interested in running your own branded nodes? The managed white label node as a service offering leverages Chorus One's highly available and proven infrastructure. Chorus One also just helped launch the Lido for Solana, Solana's liquid staking solution that allows you to stake and participate in DeFi at the same time. Head over now to course.one to start your staking journey. Also, Paraswap just came out with a huge update that's even faster and more liquid. It's cheaper than Uniswap and comes out with a new gas token that can cut your gas fees by up to 50%. Paraswap is now multi-chain and has expanded to Polygon and Binance Smart Chain, and they recently just launched an avalanche as well. Uh, so you can start trading at paraswap.io slash epicenter. Cool. All right. Welcome, guys, to the show. Uh, glad to have you on. My friend Leland uh, has spoken. You know, he talks a lot about you guys. And, he's, you know, he was like, you got you, you got to get these guys on the show. They're, like, amazing. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. So excited to have you guys on finally. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tony. It's a real pleasure to to be here. And, yeah, thanks also to, to Leland yeah, thanks for, for having introducing us. us. Before we, you know, dive into gyroscope, um, why don't you, you know, tell me a little bit about how how you guys got involved with crypto? Is this sort of your first project, or do you have like, you know, what what were you doing before? Yeah, sure. Well, so myself, um, the uh, journey started on one fairly uh, decisive day in October 2014, I think it was. Uh, when uh, Vitalik was doing his sort of Ethereum roadshow um, and he came to Cambridge University uh, and he sort of gave this talk to uh, what was a relatively uh, sort of under-attended event, I would say, uh, at the time. Uh, it's just in- incredible looking back. Um, and he talked he talked about uh, smart contracts and all of these concepts that we now know very well and, and understand. And I was very intrigued, but just sort of didn't... Uh, just sort of couldn't really, you know, wrap my head around what he was what he was proposing at the time, uh, but that was really the sort of start of my interest, um, and and since then, uh, I sort of learned a lot. I, I went on to do a, a master's in economics. Um, while I was doing that, I sort of continued to uh, really um, sort of research the space and uh, focused on many projects as they as they developed. Uh, I did a master's in economics and uh, worked uh, briefly in the city as an economist, but my uh, interest in crypto was still very, very strong. Uh, and I sort of knew that once I caught the caught the bug, I couldn't really go back. Um, so I, I I got to a point where I uh, saw there was this uh, PhD position uh, advertised uh, at Imperial College London. This was in 2018 or so, and I, I started started this uh, PhD. So uh, my PhD has been focused entirely on on DeFi. So when I started it, it was really in the um, deep depths of a bear market. Uh, really, quite a it felt like quite a kind of contrarian bet going into it, I suppose, at the time. Um, and yeah, published uh, published a number of uh, papers in, in, on this area on risks in decentralized finance uh, and then at some point uh, met Araya and uh, we yeah have uh, embarked on this stablecoin journey. Nice. Araya, how about you? Yeah, my background uh, is, is in math uh, and after undergrad I did a bit of work in uh, financial software for, for a couple of years and decided to to go into a PhD program after that because I was working on some uh, some side projects uh, around sort of like modeling complex financial systems and decided that that was kind of the more interesting area compared to the work that I was doing and uh, then went went to Cornell and kind of partway through the the, the PhD 
um, uh, around like 2017, this is when, when Maker was coming out, uh, got very interested in these more complicated sort of uh, DeFi-like uh, things being built. Uh, but before it was really called DeFi, and sort of merged half of my uh, half of my research into into that area. And so several stablecoin papers and DeFi papers have come out of that since then. And this project uh, emerged from a, a paper that Lewis and I were working on summer 2020. Uh, and then we sort of jump started this project uh, at the IC3 bootcamp uh, following that paper. Oh, nice. I love those IC3 bootcamps. I think I went to the one in uh, 2017 and that was like, you know, I think I've just met a lot of people who have been like, you know, just close friends in the space from those. Is that where you guys met as well? Or what do you guys, how do you guys like get start work, you know, decide meet and then decide to like start working together on this project? We met the previous uh, summer, so 2019. Uh, I was spending some time in in London, where my advisor is sometimes based, and uh, we we met at a, a PhD meetup here, I think. And Lewis, the you, you mentioned you were doing like economics, uh, like you're you know practicing economist. Was it like monetary economics, or was it like you know something else? So my sort of main uh, area in economics uh, that time was like. Econometrics and microeconometrics. Uh, so, yeah, really kind of concerned with like you know finding like causal impacts um, and trying to sort of un understand uh, exactly how sort of uh, certain types of economic systems work. In my work as an economist, it was um, yeah what, one of like the main areas of focus was on uh, sort of uh, yeah like litigation type work and also. Um, had a lot of yeah, exposure to uh, regulators, financial regulators, yeah, there's that sort of thing. Do you think any of it really carries over to what you're doing now? So I, I think, I mean, there are, there are two parts to that. So of course, the formal training in economics, um, well, I mean, I should probably say, so actually, right back in the very beginning of this, this journey for me, uh, I did a degree in philosophy, politics, and economics, and it was during a time of, uh, you know, just after the financial crisis, and went into this in this, you know, I attended many talks, and there are many lectures where everyone was uh, giving these talks about the sort of um, misbehavior of banks. Uh, and this is, of course, something that uh, has really been at the center of Bitcoin itself, um, where, yeah, in one of the where one of the, the first uh, block headers, there's this uh, statement about uh, the chancellor declaring the bailout of the banks or something like this. Um, but yeah, so there, there are two parts. So my sort of main uh, background in economics, of course, uh, has carried over uh, immensely, like, you know, currency models and this sort of thing is like really bread and butter of um, degree courses and master's courses in economics. Um, and then on the sort of professional side, the focus on um, like engagement with regulators uh, has also really shaped how I see um, like this industry and sort of the role that we should be playing in this industry as well. Um, through for whatever reason, I've um, engaged with uh, all you know a number of regulators in different areas, um, not just financial services actually, and I think that. One of the sort of main things that uh, I quite passionately believe is that um, you know, regulation isn't something um, necessarily to be feared. Uh, and in fact, it's something that for like well-functioning markets actually helps enable these markets. It really can play a very important role. And of course, the challenge is to make sure that uh, it's playing the right role and that, you know, it's uh, sort of a, an industry that you know, you, you can grow together, like industry and regulation. These are things that they co-evolve. And that that's one of the main beliefs I took away from my uh, professional, professional experience as an economist. Nice. And so then how did this uh, sort of lead you guys to build a stable coin? Like why, st you know, there's so many different interesting things going on in DeFi from like DEXs to lending to pure Ponzi's, uh, but like why, why, why stable coin? Why, why did that, why was that the thing you guys decided to like, okay, this is what we want to go in and fix. Well, actually, uh, a stable coin is kind of like something that pops out of what we have in mind building, but there's like a number of other things that, uh, that, that go along, along the way as well. Basically we see like 
uh, a need for robust uh, infrastructure for just like connecting various things and uh, uh, various different DeFi protocols. Sort of making composability, but with uh, risk control sort of like uh, idea as well. And one of those things is a stable coin. Another thing is uh, sort of what we consider like a robust DEX structure, um, something where if there are sort of issues with uh, certain, uh, certain, certain pairs, that you can still sort of route through the, uh, through the DEX to, to do swaps that you might, have, might want to make without the, the problem of like a central hub asset or something. I see. Interesting. Um, I guess we have to dive into how that works. Um, so, yeah. So why don't, why don't we just, I guess, start off with like, guess, how do you, the, the brief summary of like what the gyroscope protocol is and then we can like kind of dive in from there. Uh, sure. So, so the gyroscope stable coin is um, an uh, autonomous stable coin. Uh, it's one that we can sort of primarily think of as comprising of two two components. So, when you say autonomous, first, what does autonomous mean? So it it runs like by itself without ne- like necessitating um, a constant sort of human intervention. Um, that's not that's so yeah and just to add to that i suppose otherwise it it will be ambiguous so not to say there's no role for governance but just that it's not a sort of you know second by second or block by block process um so yeah but so the the stable coin you can think of it as comprising of um sort of two main elements so um the, the first element is a reserve that is fundamentally as diversified as possible so we try to diversify uh, all risks that we that we can think of in DeFi. So if you if you can uh, think of the risk and think of some way to diversify away that risk, we will uh, attempt to do that in the reserve. So it's constructed so that uh, it has contains multiple assets that uh, if there are certain types of failure mode. So the first, of course, is like uh, you know, price risk or other stable coins going through. Um, depegging events or crashes or this sort of thing. This is one type of risk. But of course, there's also regulatory risk is another major one, uh, particularly in the stablecoin space. Uh, governance risk, um, uh, plenty of uh, risk factors. And so what, what we uh, try to do with the reserve is uh, separate assets into different compartments uh, so, so that these risks are diversified to the greatest extent that we can. So that's really that's really the first thing. This this reserve. the The second thing is that we have a sort of innovative approach towards constructing uh, primary and secondary markets. And perhaps, yeah, Aria maybe wants to go through this one. Yeah, sure. Um, so here, uh, it's first worth, worth highlighting what is like a primary market, what is a secondary market, because. Sometimes the naming can make it a little uh, counterintuitive, but this is coming from like uh, like ETFs and traditional finance. So basically, the primary market is uh, if you're minting or redeeming a uh, a stable coin, uh, or in the case of ETFs, if you're minting or redeeming uh, a share for the underlying assets in the in the ETF. Um, and then secondary markets means that you're you're trading shares or trading stable coins that have already been minted and trading it. Uh, with someone else. Um, and so actually, like like kind of the, the problem in the naming here that gets confusing is that the primary activity, as in like most trading activity, usually happens on secondary markets, not primary markets. And so that can be a little confusing. Um, but basically, what we have in mind is uh, bringing this sort of structure into the, uh, the, the DeFi space with, with this stablecoin and basically de- designing the, the, this, this, the structure of this primary market in kind of the right way that, uh, that, that helps like uh, reinforce liquidity in the stable coin, um, but doesn't like take charge of like where most trading activity is supposed to happen. It's just sort of like supporting the secondary markets and the secondary markets are, are then sort of like taking the information from the, uh, the primary markets and in particular, like you have pricing bounds coming from the primary market then, and then you can construct these secondary markets uh, as AMMs that concentrate liquidity within specific ranges. Um, cool. So, okay, let's let's maybe start then with treasury first, or like the um, the you know reserves. 
So, so okay, I guess like to start off with, what kind of collateral do you guys accept currently? So, you know, the the goal is to maximize the or minimize the correlation risk. So, what what is the current collateral that's being used? Yeah, so um, primarily stable coins, but not exclusively. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you you said sort of uh, the goal is to minimize correlation risk. That is true in uh, in one sense, but it's not like the it's not an explicit objective um, it, because the it's not just about minimizing sort of uh, you know correlation in in returns or, or or prices or something like that. We do want to control for other risk factors. Yeah, it's kind of more about tail risk, so right. like correlation in tail risks. Mm-hmm. You, you yeah. mentioned a couple of different ones, like Oracle, regulatory. What about, oh, sorry, you, you mentioned like regulatory and governance. What about like Oracles? Like, do you think, how, how do you, you know, I feel like within the DeFi space, one of the biggest things is like this, like heavy reliance on very few sets of Oracles, especially like often chain link. It's like, you know, I, I, how do you sort of, how do you sort of like deal with this when like, and like nudge the protocols that you're integrating with towards like, uh, more decorrelated Oracle risks? So I, I think there are uh, a number of things. I mean, you know, this, the risks posed by Oracles, um, we're well, you know, well aware of, and we've seen many sort of bugs have occurred due to problems when over-reliance on single Oracles. Um, I think that, you know, in the first instance, um, we will go with things that are tried and tested for the Oracle approach, because also with a system like ours, it's relatively complex in terms of code base. So we, there will be this bootstrapping phase where we have to roll, roll things out and, you know, make sure that we, um, sort of don't try to do take too much innovation all at once. Um, but, but actually we, uh, have, um, put quite a bit of thought into ways to control this Oracle risk. Um, yeah, and in, in particular, trying to find ways to sort of bound the behavior of oracles and see if we can set sort of um, parameters around what we would consider reasonable input uh, feeds. Um, but I, this is cert- certainly on our sort of list of things to to do here. And so, uh, so you mentioned the stable coin. So do you have a list, do you know, like which stable coins particularly you accept right now? Or you plan to at uh, when, when launch? Right. So it's not live right now, of course. Uh, and we don't. We haven't come out with the specific uh, portfolio that will come uh, we'll, that it'll start with. Um, I think uh, the space can evolve significantly, and even just like a couple months here uh, before before the actual launch. Uh, and so we do also want like some flexibility there. But we kind of see like at a high level. Uh, the the portfolio should sort of split between uh, the various different risks, and one of the top one of the top risks uh, risk distinctions is between custodial assets and non custodial assets. Uh, with the custodial assets having a lot of uh, counterparty risks and regulatory risks, uh, more so than the uh, the, the non custodial ones, but then the non custodial ones having uh, sort of more oracle risks. Uh, more governance risks, uh, or at least on-chain governance risks, a little bit different from uh, from, from centralized governance risks, uh, as well as just like the pricing mechanism risks, kind of like what we were seeing in uh, in, in Maker back on Black Thursday, what we we're seeing in like uh, uh, the crash of all these algo stablecoins recently. Um, and so at a very high level, you would think of the portfolio as like first separating between these custodial and non-custodial risks and then segregating the uh, uh, the risks to the extent possible. Like uh, the simplest way to visualize kind of like a hierarchical ordering of risks. It may not be exactly that, um, but that, that's easy to visualize. Do you guys have a mechanism then also to like uh, target a specific ratio of like assets in the in the reserves so like you know you we can go ahead and say that like hey okay you know let's say it accepts usdc usdt and die as you know the three things and we accept all three but then what happens if our trek if our reserves just end up becoming 99 percent usdc that because that's just all people want to deposit so you do you have like some mechanism of like making sure incentivizing balancing these out 
Yeah, so the idea is that they are desired portfolio weights. Um, and these weights uh, do change over time naturally, but just as the price of those assets change. Um, so you can think of it like, like how cap weighting uh, might change uh, the weights in an ETF. Um, it, it happens in a, a passive way as those assets are repriced. And then at some point in the future, governance might come in and say, well, actually, we think the new desired portfolio weights are slightly different. And then there's like a rebalancing event to that. Um, but then, right, so uh, how the primary markets uh, work essentially is there's these desired uh, portfolio weights coming from what was initial, how it was initially set up to segregate risks. And there's some uh, ability to go outside of that, but uh, but not too much. And eventually you pay for, for going too far outside of that. Mm -hmm. And so basically, if you get to the point where uh, where you're getting too far from those weights, then it'll be more efficient to, instead of just coming in, so say, it's, uh, say it's overweighted a little bit in USDC, instead of coming in to mint more uh, gyro dollars with USDC, it's probably going to be more efficient to come in and mint with uh with DAI instead, but and you maybe you start with USDC, but you swap to DAI somewhere else, and it's more efficient to, to to do that routing. Got it. Okay, so great, that makes sense. That's like you know, so I guess in you know from your blog post, you talk about like the three layers of defense uh, in in like maintaining stability. So the first one is just these like reserves, right? And like in a world where we're over collateralized or at collateral. You know, great. The world's easy. You know, we just if you want to if you want to get out, you just swap it for, uh, for one dollar of the other thing. Obviously, the fun part of stable coins is how to design for the other world where we're going into a risky scenario. So, uh, and so I guess this is where the primary the the PAMs and the SAMs uh, come into come into play. So, okay. So, would it be fair to say that the primary? So, if I'm if I'm getting this right, the primary automated market maker is sort of, you know. Would it be fair to call it? It's more like a bonding curve that allows you to mint and burn uh, new gyro dollars or like uh, collateral tokens that you deposit, and then the secondary market maker, the secondary automated market maker is like something something like uh, Uniswap or something where the gyro dollars are uh, trading on what we traditionally call, think of as an AMM. Yeah, I think you could uh, you could say that. Basically. Uh it's a bonding curve with a specific shape that, uh, that we've encoded. And this shape sort of changes depending on the health of the system is kind of the important thing. Um, the, the, the idea there is that it's a sustainable curve always, taking into account the health of the system. And then there are two curves, actually, one for redemption, one for mint. Oh, OK. So there's kind of, it kind of creates a spread uh, in the primary market, and this spread uh, if the secondary market is behaving smartly, we'll take that spread into account in deciding how to price things. Mm -hmm. And is the uh, secondary market uh, kept in line with the primary market by the protocol itself, or does it sort of just depend on uh, external arbitragers to like come and arbitrage the secondary market into alignment? So basically, if uh, if the secondary market is ever trading outside of the, uh, the bounds from the primary market, then right, there's an arbitrage opportunity and somebody will uh, be running a keeper that, that, uh, that brings it back in line is the idea. Okay, so, but the, the protocol itself is not actually ever like, you know, it's not like Fay or something where the protocol itself is market making on the secondary market. Well, Fay is an interesting case here where they're, Secondary market and primary market is kind of like one <laughs> a bit confused yeah. into one, right? And so we are just making it explicit. What should be the primary market structure? How should that influence the secondary market? And then it's a much cleaner and much more fundamentals driven approach for, for how to build it is, is our idea. Got it. Okay. What's the benefit of do, do you not like end up losing value to like arbitrage instead of letting the protocol do the market making on the secondary market? Like, wh why not? Wh why did you choose not to do something similar to Faye? And how would you compare like the pros and cons of the two models? So basically, the primary market is market making, but in its own AMM. Basically, it, actually, I think how it will work out if you're coming to uh, to the stablecoin market as a as a user looking to buy some uh, some gyro dollars. You will go to, so, so we're first implementing this on Balancer. You'll go to the Balancer Exchange 
Uh, the Balancer Exchange has a smart order routing mechanism. Both this PAM and this SAM will be built into uh, uh, in, into the Balancer v2 uh, system. And uh, actually, if this smart order routing uh, algorithm will take into account like how much you're trying to uh, swap uh, and the, the resulting gas fees estimate, and if it's it'll route your your order in the most efficient place. Usually, that should be the secondary market. If it's a little bit out of alignment, you may actually be going straight through the primary market. And if for some reason your order is too small, that like uh, maybe the gas fees on the primary market are a little bit higher than on the secondary markets, maybe you still go through the secondary market, and then there's a rebalancing opportunity from uh, from an arbitrageur. Got it. Okay. Um, so okay. So then let's talk about how. What is the exact mechanism of how this like helps maintain stability when the reserves go uh, under collateralized? So let's say the value of um, the reserves, you know, USDT declares tomorrow, psych guys, we actually had no reserves the entire time and the value just goes to zero. And now let's say your value of your stable, the reserves goes to like 80% of what the outstanding gyro dollars are. What is the mechanism here? What happens next? I think one thing to immediately say here is that in this situation, this is already very extreme given our design. So we would like at the point that it's possible to be at a collateralization ratio of 80% or so, this means that like the first kind of defensive line, which is this diversified reserve, it means that this is... Um, already been uh yeah well breached i guess to continue with the, the analogy well what, what what is sort of the maximum that you'd be willing to let something like usdt become in your reserves as as a proportion yeah uh i mean yeah it's too early to it's too early to say at the moment um but we but th this reserve itself is intended to also be um yield uh, accruing so it's not it's not just that we can only go you know we have like the kind of say straight value of the capital and any any drops will ha harm us we've got this like additional buffer as well built into the reserve um when we first started talking about this it was uh, uh we were using this term like rainy day fund mm -hmm. uh, so ha having some capital in in case of a rainy day so this, so yeah, so just to say that in in the situation that you're describing, we're we're already um, in uh, hopefully what is a sort of quite you know part of the tail of risk for us. But then, sure. So let's say we are in the situation where um, just really quick, where does the yield come from? So you you are you taking the collateral that's put in and then you know throwing it into urine or something? Yeah. So so. Um, we will be simulating what uh, like safe levels to do with uh, different parts of the, the capital. Um, the most important thing that we will not compromise on is like uh, uh, putting the reserve in any sort of uh, dangerous or vulnerable position. So this is a feature that, again, we expect to be rolling out very slowly and possibly not in the very first version. Um, but yeah, so it will be... Um, through integration with with other protocols where it's possible to to be earning yield and yeah uh, and you know with balance of battle rewards this sort of thing. The idea is basically that like the the portfolio is supposed to uh, segregate various risks, but some assets have very similar risks, and you can deploy those assets together in certain pools uh, to earn a yield without bringing in much more risks to the portfolio. And so the the aim of the portfolio is uh, sort of like good risk adjusted sort of like a uh, deployment of assets cool okay so then let's go back to the all right we're at 80 percent. it is the doomsday scenario what now what do yeah so yeah i just wanted to uh highlight the extent to which we hope this is unusual given the design but then given we're in this situation um what what we fundamentally do is enable a agents to like coordinate on the possibility of the stablecoin um, returning to peg. So we leave open in design the uh, possibility of the this sort of equilibrium of of the peg like repegging occurring. Um, and one of the one of the mechanisms that we 
um, use here is um, baked into the, the primary market AMM itself. So this is uh, where we will essentially in times of uh, heavy uh, outflows from the protocol, the uh, redemption rates will be uh, yeah made, made, made less favorable. Uh, so we'll start to uh, sort of, in some sense, um, impose penalties penalties on redemption but mm -hmm. but we would ne we'll never stop redemption i think that's also kind of an important point to make so um and in the worst worst case it will always be possible to redeem it the sort of just the net asset value of the of the reserve um but we uh we will we're trying to sort of in, you know engender these like dynamics in the market that means that it we only would get down to this point very, very slowly, uh, and in doing so, and enable uh, agents to kind of coordinate on around this belief that the the currency will return to to the peg. Yeah, so I can fill in more there if if, if you want. I I had kind of mentioned before that the this this primary market uh, bonding curve shape basically uh, is dynamic with the with the health of the system, and the idea there is that. If you do have sort of large shocks to the reserve, like the, the setting we're describing here, uh, you want to open up the possibility that uh, that a, a peg can be maintained because there's enough like natural economic usage, economic demand for this as a as a currency, uh, and be able to support that up to a point. But then the, after that point, there's kind of like a circuit breaker effect, and you uh, the redemption price kind of decays down to the the always sustainable level, basically. Uh, and this is to basically deter bank runs and deter speculative attacks and just make, uh, ensure that the system actually survives and has a chance to recover. And supposing it, uh, like it, that, that gives it time and then all the other mechanisms can basically help the system recover is the idea. Got it. Cool. I guess this kind of goes into another like thing, which is like, you know, this like natural demand where, you know, I feel like, in stable coins, you can come up with whatever algorithmic trickery you want. And, but at the end of the day, like stable coins to work really need to have like real organic demand and like usage and adoption. Right. Um, so, and, and I don't know, in my opinion, I feel like so far I've only seen two non custodial, uh, stable coins that have actually like managed to like seem to have gotten like legitimate organic demand and that's probably like die and like terra um so what would be like your plan to like how do you guys plan to like get you know drive legitimate demand for for this stable coin for gyro dollars so that when you get into a scenario there is this like expectation and like reason and demand for it to go back to one dollar yeah, that's, uh, I think that's really answering that question. I think that really brings up many, many different topics. I mean, firstly, you know, firstly, if you, if you have the option of having an asset that is, um, you know, as low risk as you can go in DeFi, um, that already seems to be offering improvement over existing, uh, non-custodial stable coins where the risk is concentrated. Um, so I think this, you know, I think this already is uh, itself just a massive improvement having a reserve backed stable coin uh, like this, where the, the, the reserve is specifically diversified to the greatest extent that you can do so. Um, but then um, we have uh, a number of sort of core uh, ideas that we intend to uh, go with, which will enable us to bootstrap usage. Um, but before sort of talking ab about it, I think it is to sort of jump the gun a bit because something that's very important to us is, you know, for a stablecoin, legitimacy in the stablecoin is like a super important facet of it. And this is something that's like, uh, say, a fundamental value of this um, project is to ensure that we achieve uh, rapid uh, decentralization um, from you know from the beginning and we um, we already have a very active community on discord and elsewhere um, that we you know it's like helping uh, us to formulate the sort of ideas 
uh, that we want to be going with and uh, um, you know shaping shaping a stablecoin fundamentally as a kind of you know a public good um, for for DeFi and for the for the DeFi community. I'm saying that uh, because that I think that's a real caveat to the 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 fact that the you know we where we do have these uh, ideas to bootstrap economic usage, which is the most important type of usage that will you know help uh, boost boost demand for us, uh, or one of the most important. Um, th this is all very much subject to community input uh, and so on. Um, but so with with that uh, caveat out, out the way, what, one of the ideas that we are interested in at the moment is um, the possibility of a sort of U UBI type program where the uh, some you know amount of tokens um, could be distributed to uh, like community members and on some frequency in the future to be determined. Uh, and referring here to you know, stablecoin as opposed to uh, any any other token, um, but the the idea being that yeah we can somehow try to encourage like a kind of organic growth in in how the stablecoin is used, um, and in in particular in in you know places where it really is of you know fundamental value to to different market players to be able to use and have access to a stable currency, um, so you know and. Uh, unstable economies and places where inflation rates are very high and you know it's difficult to get access to to a stable currency this these are really you know f for us um this is like you know the level of values this is like the kind of very important area that we would hope to uh, be encouraging demand mm -hmm. another important area here is uh, uh kind of more the the almost b2b area of basically demand from Dow treasuries for stable-ish assets to, uh, to keep the treasury in. Mm -hmm. One thing I guess that would be, um, let's say I'm a user that has a lot of USDC and I am sufficiently confident in, uh, USDC is like, um, stability by swapping my USDC for, uh, gyro dollars. And then, and then the protocol is like, you know, taking those USDC and putting them in like urine or whatever and keeping the yield as like part of the reserves. Like, how do you drive them? How are you going to drive demand for like people to actually do this, like give up the return that they could be getting on the USDC and instead use it to like contribute to this public good, which is like growing the reserves? Yeah, so... Uh this is where I think it makes sense to talk about like a distinction of use cases. Um, most crypto use cases today are fairly speculative in nature, as opposed to, like you're saying, these like real economic adoption cases. Uh, and realistically, those speculative cases, although kind of like, if that's the only thing happening, it's a little bit self-reinforcing, of course. Um, so at some point, you have to have actual economic adoption of something for the, for the whole chain of things to make sense. Um, but realistically today, like the, the first adopters and first use cases are going to be in speculative sort of uh, uses. And then once you've, our aim is basically like make the first speculative sort of uses, uh, make the system sort of like more liquid and more able to function and provide like a various, uh, various services that, that people would want. And then kind of like once that's established as a baseline, like try to bootstrap economic usage uh, on top of that. And so the first, uh, the first use case that we're sort of building out of the gate is this, uh, this idea of a, I mean, you can kind of compare it to like a, a money market fund replacement. Uh, it's, I mean, it's quite different in structure from a money market, but it's the same sort of aims. Like basically you want a fairly stable uh, asset uh, with, uh, with, with the aims of getting some good risk adjusted uh, returns. And the idea here is that uh, this you would mint the, the first gyro dollars because you are uh, going to provide liquidity across these different SAMs, these secondary market AMMs that, that we've set up. And these secondary market AMMs are basically uh, forming a network within the, the balancer vault and connecting trades, uh, making more trades like more efficiently possible within balancer. And so basically, if, you, if you're a user of balancer, 
and this is all set up, you're going to come to Balancer, you're going to uh, use their smart order routing algorithm, uh, you're going to be routed in the most efficient path, and probably without even knowing it, you're going to be going through uh, two of these SAMs or something. Um, and basically the idea here is that compare this with uh, compare this with like uh, with like curve and like their three pool for instance uh, or, or other pools or even like these these three pools now in uh, in balancer um, the problem is if you're providing liquidity to this this three pool you're composing all of the risks of all of the assets in that and all of the places those assets are being deployed um, so for instance uh, well in the three pool you're certainly taking on USDT USDC and die all of their risks if anything breaks the whole pool basically goes to, to zero uh, in some of the other pools you also layer in compound and uh, in Aave on top of that and this means that like it's not actually like a great money market fund strategy because you're actually getting like fairly bad risk exposure but we've set up we're setting up this uh, this network of SAMs in a way where you, if you uh, sort of provide liquidity across like a number of these different SAMs, uh, your risk exposure is actually quite contained. Kind of the same idea as like this, this all weather reserve that, uh, that we're building. So yeah, I guess the difference here is that, you know, in Curve, they are allowing people to trade against the pool. Is there any way to, so it, using this like network of SAMs is sort of you're saying that this is a way of replicating that functionality that Curve provides. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and you can also make SAM. So basically, let's 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 go into what a SAM is. I guess a SAM is basically a specialized pool where you're trading gyro dollars against uh, another asset. So one SAM would be like gyro dollars USDC. Another SAM would be gyro dollars Dai. Uh, another SAM uh, going to like uh, BUSD maybe. Uh, and you can even have a, a SAM that goes to ETH, um, which is a little bit harder in, in Curve. Now they have their, their tripool. Um, uh, but basically, it's the SAMs are working because there's this primary market structure. As long as there's a primary market for this, uh, this other paired asset, you can do basically the same sort of ideas in constructing the, uh, the strategy of this pool. Mm -hmm. And then you would... Uh, basically be the idea is that you would compose these trades in these different SAMs. So saying you say you're starting with, uh, with USDC and you want to swap to, uh, to BUSD, uh, maybe there's a pool where you could directly do that. Uh, likely it also includes like a bunch of other, uh, risky assets in it. Uh, if you're doing it through, uh, through the gyroscope, sort of like a robust DEX idea, you would, uh, compose two SAMs. You, you would, Compose a swap to, to gyro dollars and then compose a swap uh, in the other SAM from gyro dollars back to BUSD. Um, and this has the benefit that if you actually have like some real market turbulence and one of these other assets actually breaks, this this deck still functions, whereas the curve uh, pool is is gone. And, and so, just so if I recall, like the SAMs exist on. The primary market maker exists like as a bonding curve, but the SAMs exist on ex external AMMs like Balancer or Uniswap and stuff. They'll both be integrated into Balancer V2. Okay. Uh, it's just that the PAM, the, the PAM is something where if you're a liquidity provider, like an individual, you can't provide liquidity to the PAM. That's only the, the protocol itself. Right. And so it's a, it would, it's going to be a Balancer pool where, uh, well, not anyone can provide liquidity. It's for the protocol itself, yeah. but it's built into into Balancer so that you can like easily compose trades and easily route through the right pools. And then, if you're uh, an individual liquidity provider, you would be considering these these different SAM pools. I see. Uh, so, and the protocol is not the one market making in those SAM pools. No. So basically, the the protocol provides these pricing bounds through the PAM. These pricing bounds influence the, the how the SAMs should be shaped, and um, either you're coming into Balancer to do a trade, and you're being routed to the most efficient venue. And if it's a large enough swap, it might be the PAM if the SAM is kind of out of alignment, uh, but it's mm -hmm. usually the SAM. Um, but if you're too small of a trade, maybe you still go through the SAMs, and then there's an arbitrage opportunity for a keeper to come along later. Why do you believe that these SAMs will become like highly liquid? Like, so you you know, you if you if your goal is to make this be this like 
common liquid, like, you know, the one of the most popular liquidity routers. Um, are there incentives for people to add liquidity to these SAM pools? Well, the precise form of uh, incentives is certainly sort of TBD. The long-term idea is that, uh, as with any sort of like LP position, like to be sustainable long-term, there should there should be sort of like organic trading demand uh, to, to use these pools. And so, so that's that's the aim, basically, is to make these profitable like LP positions that, that people actually want to use because it's providing a useful service. In this case, like immediately... Uh, connecting new new trade possibilities and balancer. Mm -hmm. Eventually, also like uh, hopefully, there's uh, there's organic demand for usage of gyro dollars itself, and it, a natural demand just to use the SAMs, just because they allow you to uh, to use gyro dollars and move from assets uh, into gyro dollars or out of gyro dollars. Why it's going to be liquid at at start comes down to uh, sort of how we've designed the system and the reserve also. So basically, that's why like it makes sense to start with a, a reserve that is like mostly other stable coins. Uh, maybe there's some uh, some other assets in the reserve at the beginning to the, the the extent that it makes sense. But because like the system is just starting out, uh, it's a lot more sensitive to 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 price risks. And so if we start with a with a system that's basically unless something really bad happens really soon is going to be. Uh, guaranteed basically like 100% reserved or slightly more as it earns yield, then the pricing bounds from the PAM are going to be quite tight and you don't actually even have to have that much liquidity in these SAMs to have, to have good liquidity, have good trades possible. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. You know, I guess uh, you guys also talked about a couple other forms of like stabil stabilization that you're looking into, like leverage loans and stuff. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So I think the best comparison here is to, to draw a comparison with, with Maker. And Maker on, on Black Thursday encountered this, uh, this deleveraging spiral, the short squeeze sort of effect on DAI that uh, brought the DAI price up to uh, over $1.10. And this had the effect on sort of vaults, the, the, the people getting leverage in, in Maker by, by minting DAI. Um, that in a crisis where they actually have to deleverage, uh, uh, sort of, they have to buy back DAI on the market at this this they're a very large premium, um, and actually they ended up losing more money in this deleveraging process than they thought they would have because it's supposed to be a dollar uh, a dollar asset, but instead there's a short squeeze effect on on DAI, and all of a sudden to deleverage the same amount there's a, a like twelve percent premium, and. Maker since then, this has been one of the big motivations for like uh, the PSM in Maker, uh, has introduced this PSM that, that basically ties the die price to one USDC. Uh, and this is basically uh, their form of like introducing a primary market, I would say. And their primary market is just adopting USDC's primary market, where now if you're in this sort of crisis and you're, you're a vault, you can come in with a if you have dollars, you go to US, you go to Circle, you get new USDC, you bring it in, swap it to DAI and deleverage your position, and you don't have to worry about these deleveraging spirals. But now if you're importing USDC risk uh, in a very large extent into, into, into Maker itself. And that's kind of motivated like gyroscope, actually, because this mechanism that we're building is basically like uh, if you were to try to do something like the PSM, which is like again, making this, this primary market structure in a as decentralized, as like uh, risk-adjusted way as possible, that's, that's our idea for Gyroscope, basically. And so Gyroscope is kind of like making a better PSM, um, which means we can also integrate with, with something like Maker uh, to, to make uh, a leveraged loans uh, uh, backing for part of the supply. And so the idea would then be that part of the gyro dollar supply would be backed by uh, by leveraged loans, just just like Maker. Part of it would be backed by the this this primary market mechanism, this PSM replacement, so to say. Um, and then you have um, basically similar sort of like security uh, to to Maker, but maybe like a little bit better because you have this sort of stronger, more robust uh, primary market mechanism. And then there was also like a, a proposal I saw of like uh, considering like getting Maker to use gyro dollars as like part of their PSM. Is that sort of 
orthogonal to this or is or are these like related in some way it's the same idea okay. it's basically like if we can work together with maker to just uh make one thing like that would be ideal okay got it and is that like you know is that in progress or like what's the status on that uh i don't think that uh that there was much like immediate interest just because it's like so far in the future mm -hmm. i guess we'll see kind of like when things get rolled out and what the interest is at that point got it okay yeah. we're, we're generally all well, it's an idea that i'm quite excited about yeah yeah and we're, we're also like as a general point of principle very uh, excited about integrations with other protocols and you know believe uh, very strongly in in like cooperation in this space and uh yeah i um personally feel you know maker was uh, one of the like key uh, projects back in 2017 or so that really uh piqued my interest in in this area we would uh would love to love to integrate with them uh i think yeah back uh, back when uh, they sort of devised the uh, cdp mechanics and uh and uh their naming naming scheme uh all of these things uh, i mean it was you know this was some some real uh, ingenuity and uh, yeah we're yeah, big fans so I guess uh, let's talk about a little bit about uh, your governance. So you guys also have been doing a lot of work on like, you know, making your governance protocol for Gyro Dollars really, um, you know, uh, resilient in a lot of ways. So um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, I guess the two big key keywords that, you know, are bolded in the doc are like conditional cash flows and optimistic approvals. Um, you want to like tell us a little bit about about these? Yeah, so we've done a fair amount of research now on sort of like the the issues about uh, decentralized governance, in particular when you have sort of like pseudo anonymous uh, people, and you the, the goal is like not to have the not to rely on the backing of like a, a legal system to work out something if there's a problem, um, and one several things that that come out of this basically is that. There are actually issues that are very parallel to some things in corporate finance. It's just kind of like amplified because you don't have the, mm -hmm. the protections of the legal system guaranteed uh, or gar guaranteed to some extent, which is some probability. And these two issues are sort of along the terms of uh, along the lines of sort of short term decision making. So things that are maybe good for uh, protocol revenues that can go to governors short term, but kind of at the expense of the, the long term health of the system. And then also basically like governance attacks or rug pulls on, on the system that, that might be attempted by, by, by a governance uh, uh, community. And that's kind of influenced us to, uh, to design these, these two mechanisms that, that you mentioned. Kind of the, the, the biggest one, the mo uh, what I consider the, the, the most interesting and innovative one really is, uh, is this optimistic approval mechanism. And what it means is that you have, uh, on a structural level at least, um, you have some party that is, is delegated to be able to make uh, make decisions, uh, and you have another party that's a that's a this guardian role in the system, and it has this optional veto right that it can exercise if it doesn't agree with the decisions made by this this designated party, and this can kind of fill in two important places in in a DeFi protocol and not just gyroscope actually like it, it can be applied in, in in DeFi more generally one of them is streamlining governance which we've seen as like a very important issue these days because of basically a voter apathy and just too many things to vote on too many things to decide basically you can use this optimistic approval mechanism to delegate to a specific group of a uh, of uh, like a subgroup of governors and these governors can make make decisions and and, uh, and post these decisions uh, and it and basically then there's a time lock period uh, during which uh, the whole governance community can come in and say well actually uh, maybe I don't like this uh, this decision and if enough of uh, if, if enough of us feel that strongly about it then we can exercise this optional veto to stop it from actually uh, being implemented. And in that way, like usually this uh, this veto right, so like you'd expect if you made the right decision about who's who's delegated, uh, that it's rarely exercised, but it's really only exercised if there's like very bad decisions being made. And this is why it can also be applied like to to, to prevent rug pulls, actually, because you can 
you can make the uh, the the guardians of this actually be the the real users of the system, like the stablecoin holders, for instance. And so now, uh, let's suppose that uh, the governance has proposed uh, a change that would 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 effectuate like a, a rug pull. Now there's a time lock period, and as long as there's some gyro dollar holders like paying attention to this uh, and then raising the alarm that hey, this is a rug pull. Um, then the idea is that uh, there's this opportunity during this time lock for enough gyro dollar holders to come together, exercise this veto right, and block the uh, uh, the rug pull action from actually happening. And this just changes the uh, the dynamics of this uh, this governance uh, game theory, basically, um, where now you you if you're a governor and you're thinking about doing a rug pull, you should be kind of skeptical that it's actually going to pass. Um, that there's like a significant probability it's going to be caught. There's this optional veto that's going to happen, and actually you're just going to hurt your uh, uh, the value of your position because now everyone's like, oh, uh, maybe I don't want to use the system because uh, look what the governors just tried to do, and so right. I'm going to exit and use a different system. I think that all makes sense. Uh, it, I guess it's like similar to like sort of the role that guardians play in a lot of like governance protocols, but it's like the idea of like, hey, we can give this guardian power to like the token holders of the, st the stable coin holders, I guess. Um, what about, I think the part that I was actually more interested on was the conditional payments. Cause I thought that was really cool where, so let me see if I understand this correctly. So what happens is that like, there's like some cash flows where, first of all, where are the cash flows coming from? Those are coming from the yield strategies. Yep. So basically there, yeah, there's a number of places that cash flows could come from uh, in the future. It really depends on like what the, how the community decides to evolve the system, of course. Um, but just to point out a few, like there are some some tasks to governance. One of them is sort of like the slow update of the uh, the, the reserve portfolio design as as the DeFi space evolves, um, and at some point they may be compensated for that uh, by uh, some of the excess yield from uh, from that portfolio. Other things are on like sort of designing the right uh, designing and implementing kind of the right uh, the right sam structures and in interaction with the pam and at some point you could have a i guess a fee switch kind of like like in uniswap where part of the uh, the fee revenue from from the sams might uh, might I might go back into the system kind of by uh, by default but maybe could also be used to incentivize uh, governors in the right direction and th that's kind of like where these cash flows could be coming from hypothetically at some point and the idea then behind the conditional cash flows is really that these, these, these cash flows that are coming into the system, where should they go? And we're saying by default, they should go to, to be an extra buffer to the reserve portfolio. And then if the system stays healthy, like uh, far into the future uh, from when these cash flows actually came in, that means that like the governors were doing, uh, it's an indication at least that the governors were doing a good job. And then uh, at that point in the future, conditional on the system remaining in this healthy state, then some of the cash flows like should be should be unlocked to incentivize governance. And so it's really about like expectations of, of future cash flows, uh, conditional on the system remaining healthy, which then sets up this incentive dynamic that, hey, we actually have to be very serious about the, the system, designing it as best as possible so that it actually remains healthy. So and, and so it would go to the um the current governors or the governors at the time when it was. So, so I, what I'm imagining is there's like some sort of like, let's say um, a six month delay on like payouts. And it's like, okay, we look at the protocol six months from now. And then we decide, okay, it actually, you know, the governors from six months ago actually did a good job. And then we pay them out, uh, you know, now is that what it's like? Or is the, is it, or do we treat, do we, or do we treat like the governance token holders, which I guess we haven't even got, gotten into the governance token, but like, do we te treat those token holders as relatively stable over time? So the precise form of this can vary. And this is something that hasn't been uh, sort of built yet. This is going to be one of the next pieces that, that comes out. But to some degree, it also like, it doesn't matter to some degree. Like basically, if, uh, if, Markets are efficient, which it may not be the case right now in crypto, of course. But let's let's suppose they are. Then, uh, if you are sort of like selling out of uh, your governance token uh, position at some point, 
the buyer of that should take into account sort of the probability that uh, that the payouts would actually happen from these conditional cash flows. And so you should get a fair price if it's a fair market. Um, but that's really a long-term idea, of course, that, that these systems are actually like efficient markets. So you guys have this sort of like um, live incentivized test net going on right now. Um, what is the, how does it work? And, you know, I, I saw that there's different phases and it's sort of a little bit gamified. Um, what What's the goal of this? Is this to sort of get people familiar with the UX of the protocol or is it to, you know, test out certain economic assumptions or um, what's, what's ultimately the end goal of this test net? So I think there are a few goals, uh, really. The first is, uh, again, about uh, growing an active community of uh, users from from the beginning. Um, but yeah, it's also been um, so. Pe- perhaps I should just yeah maybe give a bit of detail about about what the game actually is. So um, it's uh, <laughs> sort of very at least visually it's based on um, on a, a flight simulator. Uh, but it, uh, unfortunately, there is little flying that you can actually do. This uh, I think the sort of the, yeah, I think if you attempted to build a flight simulator on Solidity, I'm not sure what would I'm not sure what would happen, but I, I don't suggest trying. Um, so that there, there is no flying, but the idea is that um, you go through these like uh, two and uh, two and a half levels we have at the moment, where you can sort of learn about the core mechanics of the protocol and get some familiarity with. Um, the you know how the like the minting and redeeming operations work in the primary market and these these sorts of things um, and so by going through that we hope that you know, one of the first things is that people are able to uh, learn about what we're building and like learn the language that we we think like fits this best and it's also for us uh, an interesting experiment in uh, seeing you know see, seeing what feedback we get and seeing what sort of resonates. Uh, resonates with the community and also uh, there are a few mechanisms uh, in the this very early testnet version that um, we wanted to get sort of tested a bit in a uh, yeah in a live environment uh, to see how see how they work and see um, see if there are sort of edge cases that emerge through time that we haven't thought of up front so it's it's been sort of a uh, way for all you know both sides in this to to learn in the beginning and yeah that's uh it's been it's been quite it's been quite a fun uh fun ride as well uh, with this game um so yeah that's, Do you think that's, you've uh, found like interesting economic insights even though that these are using like valueless testnet tokens so i from the the testnet itself um I would say this is uh, a question that's like to be to the, the full answer to that is to be revealed later because what we've mainly done so far is um, tested like the most basic mechanics in the system, but there are more sort of sophisticated elements that we're interested in in testing out and seeing what what insights we we can can get from from that. Um, but we've we've certainly uh, yeah we've certainly taken uh, many other uh, yeah, very. Uh, yeah, big insights in like how how to manage like sudden influxes of users. We had a occurrence where we suddenly had uh, just yeah an absolutely insane amount of traffic. I think you know, six weeks ago or something like this. And this uh, this was a, a really real experience. Um, we we have so one of the things that we had to deal with. It's a bit um, a bit of a detailed remark i suppose but like the some of the faucets uh for coven were a bit uh a bit shaky and so <laughs> we b- built our own faucet mechanisms and uh we had this yeah massive influx of people wanting to try this and we uh, had to like do some sort of on the fly uh debugging of what was going on with our faucet and uh really yeah man- scale this quickly um so we've uh, yeah we've certainly we've certainly learned quite a bit from the process of having this in a testnet environment. One of the other main aims of the uh, the testnet is really to provide a setting where we can like help walk users through how the how the system works. And so this whole idea that I was explaining before about like what's a PAM, what's a SAM, 
and like what do they do and how do you use them uh they're kind of opaque concepts until you actually like walk through it and use them and you can actually do that on the test net and uh i think that's helped a lot in terms of uh, the community understanding how these mechanisms work at least on a high level nice so what's the best way for people to start getting involved like i guess Step one is getting involved with this test net. Uh, you guys mentioned there's a new phase that's coming out the day that we're recording this right now. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's right. So um, we would say yeah, regarding our sort of third level, uh, definitely uh, yeah, on the day of recording, it's uh, we'll be making announcements about that. Um, we, in terms of getting involved more broadly, um, yeah, certainly the test net, also the Discord is like the primary place. We're all yeah, on there um, all, all the time responding to questions and th that sort of thing. So that's, mm -hmm. if you want to get in touch with us, that's definitely the best way to immediately get involved with the project. Um, and then, yeah, for more more resources, I mean, we we, yeah, we have, have a blog and the, the docs are also uh, fairly comprehensive. So that's, uh, yeah, th those, are, those are quite good resources. Uh, I think there's also, there's, we've... Uh, there's a good amount of content um, on on uh, YouTube if uh, yeah if uh, anyone also enjoys video for the video format. Sweet, awesome. Um, any last words or anything you want to share with people uh, before we sign off? Uh, no, I, I I don't think so. It's really been a massive pleasure to uh, be be uh, on this podcast. So yeah, thanks very much indeed for for having us, Sunny. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming on. Yeah, thank you.